on World News Tonight. Continuing war, Ukraine reaches a grim milestone of reaching six months since Russia launched its invasion. XPM jailed. First former Malaysian leader put behind bars for over a decade for his role in the 1MDB scandal. Flooding threat. Parts of the U.S. continue to drown as severe storms keep pounding the nation. Tonight, find out where the threat is moving. And surf's up. Windsurfers grace the picturesque Lake Silverplana in Switzerland. This is Adaderna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we begin with the updates in the war in Ukraine. Now, Ukraine marks its sixth month of the Russian invasion today. And authorities there have shared some tragic numbers to hit home the ongoing painful plight of their people. This comes as the Ukrainians mark the 31 years since they broke free from the Russian-dominated Soviet Union. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was defiant on Tuesday, vowing a tough response on Russian forces if they attack on or around his country's Independence Day. As Ukraine is also set to mark six months since Russia's invasion, there is concern among Ukrainian and allied officials that Russia would target civilian and government infrastructure in the next few days. The U.S. Embassy has urged its citizens to leave Ukraine immediately. Zelensky also vowed Ukraine would restore its rule over the Crimea region annexed by Russia in 2014. We will get Crimea back by any means we deem right, without consulting other countries. As for direct attacks, Ukraine doesn't attack any civilians, neither in foreign countries nor on temporarily occupied Ukrainian territory. We know what we are doing. We know where the military objects and depots are. Ukrainian soldiers are able to work according to plan there. Zelensky's comments came as leaders of dozens of countries and international organizations were taking part in the so-called Crimea platform, most of them by video, in solidarity with Ukraine. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was among them. We must continue to insist that Crimea is Ukraine, just as Donetsk and Luhansk are Ukraine just as every other part of the country is Ukraine. That was our position in 2014. It's our position in 2022. Fears of intensified Russian attacks followed the killing of Daria Dugina, the daughter of a prominent Russian ultranationalist. She was killed in a car bombing near Moscow on Saturday, which Moscow has blamed on Ukrainian agents. But Kiev denies this. Authorities have told Ukrainians to work from home where possible from Tuesday to Thursday. Zelensky had warned over the weekend that Moscow might try something, quote, particularly ugly in the run-up to Wednesday's Independence Day, which will mark its independence from Soviet rule since 1991. Kiev has banned large public gatherings until Thursday, fearing crowds could become targets. Former Malaysian Prime Minister began a 12-year prison sentence for his role in the 1MDB scandal. This comes after a top court in Malaysia dismissed the former PM's appeal, making the 69-year-old the first former Malaysian leader to be put behind bars. The former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Najib Razak, has been ordered by the country's highest court to begin a 12-year prison sentence after the court upheld his prior guilty conviction on charges related to the multi-billion dollar graft scandal at the state fund called One Malaysia Development Bahad, or One MDB. Knocking back Najib's final appeal, the country's top court also denied his request for a stay of sentence. Najib was found guilty by a lower court in July 2020 of criminal breach of trust, abuse of power and money laundering for illegally receiving about 10 million US dollars from SRC International, a former unit of 1MDB. He'd been out on bail and pending appeals. This was Najib on Tuesday, hours before the ruling. I'd like to thank everyone for showing up and showing me your support. I have tried with all that I can, but everything I propose to the court is rejected. I did not get my justice and I didn't get a fair trial based on its principles. He's also facing a fine of over $46.8 million. 
The court had earlier rejected an effort by Najib to forestall the final verdict by requesting the removal of the Chief Justice from the panel. Prosecutors have said some $4.5 billion was stolen from 1MDB, which was co-founded by Najib during his first year as Prime Minister in 2009. Investigators say they traced more than $1 billion of 1MDB money to accounts linked to him. The National Archives in the U.S. are offering new insights into the nature of the classified documents that have triggered cascading alarm bells since at least the start of the year over the materials held by former U.S. President Trump. The archives discovered more than 700 pages of classified documents at Trump's Florida home and in addition to material seized by FBI agents. Tonight, stunning new revelations about those documents recovered from Mar-a-Lago. According to the New York Times, citing people briefed on the matter, more than 300 documents had classified markings. Some were handed over by former President Trump earlier this year. Others seized in that controversial FBI search of his home. All as the National Archives posted the letter it sent to Trump lawyers back in January, after Mr. Trump had sent them 15 boxes of documents. The the letter said the boxes included 100 classified documents, 700 pages in all, including up to the level of top secret, warning there was a criminal investigation and DOJ assessment of potential damage resulting from the apparent manner in which these materials were stored. According to the letter, President Biden authorized the National Archives to reject any executive privilege claims by Mr. Trump, allowing the FBI to examine the material. Then in June, Mr. Trump turned over additional classified documents to DOJ officials. And according to the Times, 11 sets of classified documents were retrieved during the FBI search at Mar-a-Lago on August 8th. That unprecedented search of a former president's home sparking significant blowback from Republicans and Mr. Trump, who just filed a lawsuit to block review of the documents until a watchdog known as a special master is appointed. Mr. Trump blasting the DOJ investigation as politically motivated. His lawyers writing in their suit, to date the government has failed to legitimize its historic decision to raid the home of a president who had been fully cooperative. Now still in the U.S., severe storms are on the move in Louisiana and Mississippi after historic and deadly flooding in Dallas. And the Texas governor declared a disaster in 23 communities. With more rain in two days than the city typically sees in months, tonight Dallas is facing its second worst flooding in nearly a century. The building is literally cracking right now. The rain turning roads into rivers, leaving dozens of cars stranded. One young girl had to be carried to safety when her family's RV flooded. This was the first time in 90 years that we've had this much rain in a 24-hour period. Vanessa Villas says they had almost no warning the water rose so quickly. The unforgiving waters have already claimed at least one life. In Mesquite, Texas, officials say a woman's car was swept off the road. Inside, she was on the phone with her family before losing contact. Tonight, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has declared a state of emergency. We have uh, more than 100 homes being damaged or impacted in some way. Nearly three million people remain under flood watch, including parts of Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, where many are already struggling to clean up from round one. Even parts of Arizona left waterlogged. While further west, millions more are weathering the sweltering sun. Five million people are under heat alert, with some temperatures across California expected to top 100 degrees. The Biden administration is releasing an additional 1.8 million doses of the monkeypox vaccine as health officials are not able to keep up with demand. However, first dose recipients are growing frustrated with the rollout. Tonight, all 50 states reporting at least one case of monkeypox and New York State reporting its first child diagnosed with the virus. New York City accounts for almost 20 percent of America's largest ever monkeypox outbreak, reporting more than 2,500 cases. New Yorkers done with the first dose of the vaccine growing restless. I would get a second shot anywhere that it was available. Like Connor DeVoe and Matthew Hampton, New York City residents say they know others who have received the second dose outside the city. 
I do feel like it's odd that the state of New York has not prioritized a more densely populated area like Manhattan. So far, the New York City Health Department says it has administered 63,000 vaccines. 92% of them received by members of the LGBTQ plus community as of August 18th. At the federal level, the White House announcing they'll release additional vaccines. An additional 1.8 million doses of vaccine will be available to jurisdictions for order. The new batch sent to locations that administer the vaccine interdermally and have used 90 percent of their current supply, like New York. The Biden administration declared monkeypox a public health emergency on August 4th after criticism it was not moving fast enough to address the crisis. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, contraction in the Eurozone economy for a second straight month pinned the single currency to a 20-year low against the dollar, with surging gas prices adding to misery dragging Europe towards a recession. Eurozone business activity contracted for a second straight month in August. That's according to a key survey released Tuesday. It showed the cost of living crisis forced consumers to cut spending and supply constraints hurt manufacturers. S&P Global's Flash Eurozone Composite Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI, is seen as a good guide to overall economic health. In August, it fell to 49.2 from 49.9 in July. A reading below 50 indicates a contraction. August's preliminary estimate was the lowest since February last year. Manufacturing activity in the block fell again this month. The factory PMI dipped to 49.7 from 49.8, its lowest since June 2020. A downturn in European powerhouse Germany deepened in August, according to a separate PMI survey. Companies saw demand fall due to a combination of high inflation, rising rates and economic uncertainty. And France's PMI showed its economy contracted for the first time in a year and a half. The outlook ahead looked bleak too, as overall demand in the block fell for a second month. The global economy is increasingly seen at risk from recession. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's strict lockdowns have further hurt supply lines that were already struggling from the health crisis. Consumers face the highest inflation in a generation. That has forced central banks to tighten monetary policy, just as the economies need support. The World Trade Organization released its latest global trade goods barometer, which has remained steady largely due to the lifting of COVID-19 lockdowns in China. The WTO says that its global trade goods barometer remains steady at 100, as the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is being offset by the relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions in China. The barometer is a leading indicator that signals changes in world trade growth, and is updated on a quarterly basis. Readings greater than 100 suggest trade growth, while a reading below 100 means stagnant trade. The latest data is consistent with the organization's most recent trade forecast in April, which predicted 3% growth in the volume of world merchandise trade in 2022. The Geneva-based international body explained Tuesday that global trade growth slowed to 3.2% in the first quarter, compared to 5.7% in the quarter before. It also slowed in the second quarter, but did post quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth. It stated that while the latest readings remain steady, stagnant growth would continue going forward. The report further added that indices for air freight and electronic components are pointing down, while the raw materials index has recently risen slightly above the baseline value of the index. It also noted that the container shipping index has risen significantly as Chinese ports have eased COVID-19 restrictions. The Democratic Republic of Congo has confirmed a new case of the Ebola virus. A 46-year-old woman from the eastern province of North Kivu tested positive for the virus following her death. A new case of Ebola virus has been confirmed in the city of Beni in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. That's according to the country's National Institute of Biomedical Research, or INRB, on Monday. 
A statement from INRB added that testing showed the case was genetically linked to the 2018 to 2020 outbreak in North Kivu and Ituri provinces, which killed nearly 2,300 people. Another flare-up from that outbreak killed six people last year. Congo's most recent outbreak was in a different part of the country and was declared over in July after five deaths. Ebola can sometimes linger in the eyes, central nervous system and bodily fluids of survivors and flare up years later. The case was confirmed in a woman who died on August 15th after being admitted to a hospital in Beni on July 23rd, the statement said. It added at least 131 contacts of the woman have been identified, including 60 frontline healthcare workers. 59 of them are vaccinated against Ebola. Investigations are ongoing to determine the source. We have some good news for you. Researchers in South Korea are seeking to facilitate the daunting task of cleaning up oil spills at sea. Mauritius, an island nation off the coast of East Africa, is famous for its natural beauty. But in 2020, an environmental catastrophe struck when a Japanese cargo ship ran aground and spilled over 1,000 tons of low-sulfur, high-viscosity oil. The International Maritime Organization had mandated that all ships should only use low-sulfur oil starting from 2020. Low-sulfur oil, however, hardens easily when it comes into contact with cold seawater, making it difficult to remove. But a South Korean research team has developed an eco-friendly net that can easily remove sticky oil. It uses a similar method to how some carnivorous plants catch insects. Some carnivorous plants have small fiber hairs on their surface. These fiber hairs become slick when they meet and absorb water by creating a thick, hard layer of fluid and cause insects to slip. The researchers developed an eco-friendly fiber that imitates the plant's fiber hairs to make the special net. The net made with this fiber lets water pass through while trapping the oil. When the net's thin fibers meet water, they form a water layer and let oil separate easily from the surface of the net. This allows the net to be used multiple times without its efficiency wearing off. The research team conducted an experiment with the South Korean Coast Guard and found that it's possible to recover a ton of low sulfur oil per day with the newly developed net. We learned that the water layer created by the fibers of carnivorous plants also lets oil drip off easily. This is particularly useful information in the case of high viscosity oil, and we thought we could apply this principle when removing oil from water. The research team says the developed technology could also be applied to marine oil removal gloves and work clothes. The same team is conducting follow-up research to develop a machine that could automatically recover oil from the ocean by applying similar technology. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Japan saw a record number of 343 daily COVID-19 deaths amid fast-spreading seventh wave of the coronavirus infection. The country feared a strain on the medical system fueled by a resurgence of infections. Canadian and German leaders signed a hydrogen alliance aimed at accelerating efforts to export clean fuel to Germany by 2025. The deal was made during Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz's first official visit to Canada. Apple is planning to make the iPhone 14 in India in a move to narrow the production gap from the typical six to nine month of previous launches. Prolonged high temperature weather with little rain has led to continuous drought in some regions of China, bringing severe challenges to agricultural production. Today marks the 30th anniversary of the diplomatic ties between South Korea and China. Seoul and Beijing will simultaneously hold an event this evening to celebrate this milestone. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we are leaving you tonight with a look at over 250 windsurfers gracing the picturesque Le Silver Plana in Switzerland for an Engandian wind one-hour race. Stay safe and have a good night.